Welcome to the Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another in-service review by the Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a review of both microsurgery and the flap section. This is a supplementary episode and not meant to be a comprehensive review. This is a breakdown of key points from previous exams that may help if you are studying for boards or for the in-service. Sanam is joining me today. Hi, how are you? Hey guys, I'm good. Thank you. So before we get started today, I just wanted to take a moment to appreciate a few things. The Loop team has put in a lot of man hours behind the scenes to make this production possible especially Greta, who has been working countless hours and she's been working on mostly editing and graphics. And we should really give her a shout out for everything that she has done for us. And when I actually think about it, it's just incredible that we have residents joined together from around the country. We have six different programs represented with three different time zones. And for example, right now I'm virtually recording with Sanam, who is three hours behind me, her in Sacramento, me in Atlanta. It's just really cool to know that we're taking our experience outside of our individual programs and branching out. Currently, we have me, Sanam, and two other main core hosts and several guest hosts, and we're constantly adding more guests. After in-service, you have probably already heard that we have a lot of fun surprises for you guys, including practice for mock orals. I know. This is all amazing. It's great that we're bringing everybody together, and I'm excited about what we have in store. Let's get started with today's content. Let's start with microsurgery. Let's talk about anticoagulation first. And first, let's focus on preoperative anticoagulation. There's a paucity of data, and there's really no consensus on whether patients should get it or they shouldn't preoperatively. Intraoperatively, if there's vessel spasm, you can use an antispasmodic agent like papaverin. You can also use 4 or 2% lidocaine. Keep in mind, Vasopressors have not been shown to increase complications. So if your patient is hypotensive, don't deprive them of an adequate blood pressure. There's always a question about this on the end service. Post-op anticoagulation, so heparin, this is used to increase antithrombin 3. Dextran, which is a polysaccharide whose mechanism of action is thought to involve decreasing platelet aggregation by altering the electric charge of platelets, as well as by decreasing blood viscosity. Dextran also acts as a volume expander. So keep in mind, we never use Dextran because it has so many side effects, including acute kidney injury, but it is still on the in-service. So it's either going to be a distractor, or I guess you could be asked about the acute kidney injury or its mechanism. So we will also review all these medications again at the end, since we all know this takes repetition. A few words about the venous anastomosis. First, should you do hand sewn versus coupler? They have a similar patency rate, so the use of either is up to the surgeon. Benefits of the coupler, though, are that it's faster, so you can cut down on your surgical time. Good for size mismatch of the donor and recipient veins. The only contraindication is calcified vessels, and that makes sense, right, because it's based on the fact that you can't fold a calcified vein because it's so stiff over a coupler. Now moving on to monitoring. So the gold standard for monitoring is still clinical exam. Of course, we have handheld arterial Dopplers, but this requires a skin paddle. There's also internal Doppler, such as the Cook Doppler. This can be used anytime, but for buried flap, it has the most sensitive monitoring. You otherwise will not be able to check a signal like you would if you had a skin paddle. Another monitoring option is near infrared spectroscopy or NIRS. This measures the tissue oxygen saturation, or you will also see it called tissue oximetry. It is a surrogate for tissue perfusion because it uses infrared light to measure the relative concentrations of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. The important thing to know is it actually has higher flap salvage rates Again, that is a higher flap salvage rate because it has earlier recognition of vascular compromise. Now let's talk about flap salvage. So early operative re-exploration is imperative, aka 99% of the time on the question, the answer is always going to be to take them back to the operating room. But you can perform a thrombectomy and then flush the flap with TPA. So what's TPA? It activates plasminogen to create plasmin and cleave fibrin. In other words, TPA is used for fibrinolysis, which means it actually breaks up the clot. Plasmin is directly fibrinolytic. The TPA functions better than urokinase or streptokinase. 
TPA has fewer bleeding complications as well compared to streptokinase. Of note, TPA is only to be injected through the flat vessels. It is contraindicated to give systemically. So arterial thrombosis has the lowest salvage rate compared to venous thrombosis or from mechanical causes. And the rates are quoted as 40% for arterial, 71% for venous, and 90% for mechanical, such as hematoma. And that's for the flat salvage rate. Okay, now let's talk about my least favorite area of plastic surgery, leeches. They don't treat total venous occlusion. They secrete hirudin in their saliva, which is a thrombin inhibitor. And it requires the use of prophylactic antibiotics for the bacteria Eremonis hydrophilia. Morgan, do you remember from our stuff tissue lecture, what's the first line antibiotic you would use for this for prophylaxis? Yes, of course. It's a fluoroquinolone. And remember, if the patient is a child, you must use a third generation cephalosporin. Okay, now let's move on to a separate topic. We are combining the flap section since, since it is also a small section. First in the section is local flaps. Local flaps can consist of rotational flaps, advancement flaps, an example being V to Y advancement, bipedicled flap, or a keystone flap, or transposition flaps, example would include Z-plasty, rhomboid flaps, or bilobed flaps. Before we move on to individually talk about all these flaps, it's really important to separate some stuff out in the beginning. One thing to keep in mind is that the rotation flap or advancement flaps have the benefit of being able to be re-rotated or re-advanced, whereas transposition flaps, you can't do that. So if you're designing a local flap to cover a pressure sore, for example, you want to be able to re-advance it because these have a high reoccurrence rate at about 70% despite your best efforts. The other thing to know is also the difference between a rotation flap and a transposition flap. Both of them are a pivot flap, right? They're pivoting into the defect. The difference is the transposition flap, in order for it to pivot into the defect, it jumps over healthy tissue. On the other hand, when you think of a rotation flap, like for example, for a pressure sore, all it's doing is it's sliding into the defect. It's not going over any healthy tissue to get to that defect. Good to know. A little bit more about Z-plasty, which again is considered a transposition flap and is used often to elongate scars. So when you design the Z-plasty, the central limb is drawn parallel to the line of maximum tension. And then subsequent limbs are drawn anywhere from 30 to 90 degrees from this. The wider the angle, the greater the elongation, but it will be at higher tension. Now let's talk about the question that everybody loves to ask, whether you're in the OR or are you on your in-service. How much length do you get with a Z-plasty? It depends on your angle. A 30-degree angle gets you about 25% increase in length. A 45-degree angle, 50% increase. A 75-degree angle, about 100% increase in length. And a 90-degree angle gets you about 120% in length. So the sweet spot is 60 degrees because it usually gives you adequate lengthening at about 75% without causing too much tension. After local flaps, we have regional flaps. This could be a propeller flap or a pedicle flap. Let's talk a little bit more about each one. So a propeller flap is a fascia cutaneous flap based off of a single perforator and is more of like a freestyle design. You rotate about 180 degrees. So because of that rotation, it's prone to venous congestion. And if it happens intraoperatively, the venous congestion, then you can dissect back to the source vessel and free up the attachments. You could also use venous supercharge, and you can also replace it inside too and do a delayed reconstruction, but it's still susceptible to congestion. Let's move on now to named pedicled or free flaps. Pedicled, again, being a regional option and free flap for distant soft tissue coverage. Let's start with defining the mathis nahai classification. Keep in mind, this is specific for muscle flaps. Type one has one dominant pedicle. An example would include the tensor fascia lata flap or one head of the gastroc or the rectus femoris. A type two flap has one dominant pedicle and one minor, basically segmental branches. The difference between a type two and a type five is that in a type two, the minor pedicle cannot supply the whole muscle. So you need that dominant pedicle. But in a type five, you can actually have your flap survive based off of their segmental branches. And the example for a type two would be your gracilis, soleus, and trapezius. 
Type 3 has two dominant pedicles, and keep in mind, uh, this means the muscle may be split to preserve muscle function. Examples would include the gluteus, rectus abdominis, and serratus. A type 4, which is solely based off of segmental branches, examples of that would be a sartorius or a tibialis anterior flap. There seems to always be a question about the sartorius being a segmental blood supply, so take note of this. Sartorius, type 4. Sartorius, type 4. Sartorius, type 4. Hopefully that was annoying enough for that to stay in your brains. Type 5, so this is one dominant pedicle and also a minor pedicle that is able to supply the entire muscle. An example would include latissimus and also the pectoralis major. Now we're going to go pretty quick through a lot of various flaps. All of these can be used regionally or as a distant free flap. Let's start with the upper extremity donor sites, the radial forearm flap. Okay, the one thing to remember about the radial forearm flap is that if you're going to use it, you have to perform an Allen's test prior to harvesting because obviously you're taking the radial artery and you want to make sure that your palmar arch is ulnar dependent and it's not relying on that radial artery. And you can take this flap as an osteocutaneous flap as well. Next is the posterior interosseous flap. So this is a septocutaneous island flap based on the posterior interosseous artery raised from the posterior aspect of the forearm. It can be used as a regional flap to cover defects of the elbow of the antecubital fossa or the proximal volar forearm. The posterior interosseous artery is found between the extensor carpi ulnaris and the extensor digiti minimi. It can also be based off retrograde flow due to the anastomosis between the posterior and the anterior interosseous arteries in order to cover defects of the wrist and hand. Then there's the anterior interosseous flap. I mean, pretty obvious. It's based off of the anterior interosseous artery. The pedicle is found between the flexor digitorum profundus and FPL or flexor pollicis longus. Next, the lateral arm flap. So the pedicle is the posterior radial collateral artery. Last year, they asked the pedicle location, which is between the lateral head of the triceps and the brachialis. The skin paddle can be 12 by 16 centimeters, and you can actually close the donor site primarily. So this is why a lot of people love this flap, that you can just close the donor site. You can also use it in reverse. So the reverse lateral arm flap flow is from the recurrent radial artery, and this is used for elbow or antecubital fossa coverage. Now let's talk about lower extremity donor sites. You have the anterolateral thigh flap, commonly known as the ALT flap. The pedicle is the descending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex. There's perforating branches through the vastus lateralis and rectus femoris muscles, and occasionally through the intermuscular septum. It's a workhorse flap, it has a long pedicle, and it can potentially be used as a chimeric with muscle such as vastus lateralis or bone. You can use it when you need to cover a large defect and you can provide good bulk. And it can also be a sensate flap. You can take the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So next is the tensor fasciolata flap. The pedicle is the ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex artery. And this can be used as a pedicle flap for abdominal wall reconstruction. Moving on to the gristillus flap. That's the medial femoral circumflex artery, which is a branch from the profunda between the adductor longus and the adductor brevis. The arterial supply of these three flaps makes sense if you think about where they're located. The tensor fascia lata and the ALT flap are on the lateral portion of your legs. That's why they're coming from different branches of the lateral femoral circumflex. And the gracilis muscle is running on the medial portion of your thigh. So that's why you have the medial femoral circumflex supplying it. And when you harvest this flap with a skin paddle, it's called a tug flap or the transverse upper gristillus flap. The muscle is about, it's small, it's about five to six centimeters in size and it has a short pedicle. It's the workhorse flap for functional muscle transfer, so think facial reanimation. So you should know that it's innervated by the branch of the obturator. Next is groin flap, so the pedicle is the superficial circumflex iliac artery, or the SCIA, and this can be free or pedicled and is fasciocutaneous. And you have the gluteal system, which the pedicle comes from the internal iliac vessel and exits through the greater sciatic foramen. Now you have to think about two different kinds of flap. The first one is the S-gap or the superior gluteal artery perforator flap. As the name implies, it's superior. So the perforator, the superior gluteal artery, travels superior to the piriformis and inferior to the gluteus medius. In contrast, 
the inferior gluteal artery perforator flap or the eye gap, the artery for that travels inferior to the piriformis. So the superficial sural artery flap is based on the medial sural artery. It is a thin fascia cutaneous flap, but has a fairly short pedicle. You can reverse this due to the connection between the medial sural artery and the peroneal artery and make this a regional pedicled flap and cover the distal third of the leg. There's a major problem with this though, because it frequently has venous congestion requiring delay or leech therapy. The lesser saphenous vein is the primary drainage. Then you have the medial plantar artery flap. The pedicle is basically its name, the medial plantar artery, and it lies between the abductor hallucis and flexor digitorum brevis. They love to ask this question on the end service where the pedicle is, so that's why we put this on here. But just remember, it's between the abductor hallucis and flexor digitorum brevis. This is usually pedicle to cover the heel to replace like with like using sensate glabrous skin onto the weight-bearing surface. Now onto trunk donor sites. First, the latissimus dorsi flap. We should all know this one. The dominant pedicle is the thoracodorsal artery. It can be free or pedicled. You can use muscle only or musculoskeletal cutaneous. It's commonly used for chest wall reconstruction or free to cover large defects. TDAP, thoracodorsal artery perforator flap. That's when we harvest it as a perforator flap. It has a long pedicle and large cutaneous territory. The skin battle can be from 18 centimeters wide and up to 55 centimeters long, and it can be harvested on a single perforator. And the pedicle is the descending branch of the thoracodorsal artery. And again, it can be harvested as a chimeric flap with muscle and or bone. So next up is the subscapular system, and this can give rise to several flap variations. Most importantly is the periscapular flap. The pedicle is the descending branch of the circumflex scapular artery and it emerges from the triangular space. And this space is the teres minor, the teres major, and the long head of the triceps. This is important since you do not have to divide muscle to harvest this flap. So if the question asks which fascia cutaneous flap is best for say, a bodybuilder that is concerned about taking a muscle, the periscopular flap has the most reliable septocutaneous perforator coming from the triangular space and not from muscle. And again, you can take this as a chimeric flap with skin, sub-Q, scapula, serratus, rib, or latissimus. And then the also familiar trapezius flap, that's a mathis in the high tide too. It's principally supplied by three vascular sources. You can get it from the transverse cervical artery, the dorsal scapular artery, or the posterior intercostal artery branches. Next, the rectus. So this can be based superiorly off the superior epigastric artery or inferiorly off the deep inferior epigastric artery. And it can be pedicled or free, can be used as a musculocutaneous flap with various skin island designs, including tram or transverse rectus abdominis, vertical or VRAM, which is vertical rectus abdominis, or O-RAM, which is oblique rectus abdominis. There are variations on this, including muscle sparing free tram, where only a small cuff of muscle is taken around the pedicle, versus deep, which dissects out the perforators sparing the rectus muscle. Taking the entire muscle has donor site morbidity with frequently a resultant bulge in this area. As you know, we frequently use this for breast or chest wall reconstruction, either pedicled or free, but it can also be used to cover defects of the groin or the perineum. Okay, the omentum. The pedicle is the left or right gastroepiploic, and if you're going to use it as a free flap, you want to use the right gastroepiploic artery. The downside is having to enter the abdomen. It has a robust blood supply, and it can be pedicled and used to fill the dead space in the mediastinum or for a deep sternal defect. The following are the most common vascularized bone flaps. So free fibula flap, the pedicle is the peroneal artery and is often used as an osteocutaneous flap for mandibular reconstruction. The medial femoral condyle. The pedicle is a descending genicular artery and it has a robust and reliable blood supply, so it's frequently used. Iliac crest osteocutaneous flap. The pedicle is the deep circumflex iliac artery. And we've already talked about it, but another option for vascularized bone is the periscopular flap. Of course, that was by no means a comprehensive list of flaps, but it did include all the ones you will likely see on the in-service exam. 
We basically covered this in the chest wall lecture, but also included in this section for flaps is always a question about a chronic wound in an irradiated field. And the best option is debridement followed by transfer of healthy non-radiated tissue. Keep in mind, you should biopsy first to rule out reoccurrence or malignancy. That has completed the content portion of this episode. Let's finish up with a rapid fire pharmacology review from the microsurgery portion. All right. What about aspirin? This is an acetyl salicylic acid. It inhibits COX-1 and 2 or cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. So it therefore blocks thromboxin A2, which is a platelet aggregator and a vasoconstrictor. It also blocks prostacyclin. Herudin from the leeches. Oh, gross. Direct thrombin inhibitor. Remember, thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, creating clot formation. So this blocks that. Heparin. It increases antithrombin 3, so it indirectly inactivates thrombin, and it also an inactivates factors 9, 10, 11, 12. Dextran. It decreases factor 8 and von Willebrand factor. It also decreases platelet function, modifying fibrin structure, and it's a volume expander. So because of its side effects, it's not recommended, and the risks are anaphylaxis, acute renal failure, volume overload, pulmonary edema, ARDS, MI. Sounds like a great drug. Yeah, we would never use that. All right, what about TPA? It activates plasminogen to create plasmin and cleave fibrin. It's a fibrinolytic. Papaverin. Inhibition of the enzyme phosphodiesterase. It causes an elevation of CAMP, cyclic AMP levels, which vasodilate. Use this intraoperatively for vasospasm. Now, who knew that would be a sneaky way to make you learn parts of the clotting cascade and mechanism of action of medication? Yikes. Well, thank you everyone for listening and getting through that with us. That was a fast overview, although a ton of material of what you are likely to see on the in-service exam related to microsurgery and flaps. Until we chat again, you're in the loop.